Hey there, class. Good to be with you today. Hope you're having a great day today. Um, we are in language class and we are in reading. We are reading our classroom novels, uh, Number of the Stars. Um, so we are going to be in chapter seven and eight today. Right, so remember that uh, Anne Marie and Ellen um, and Anne Marie's mom, Mama, also known as Inga in her real name, uh, they have just traveled, and Kirsty, of course, they have just traveled to um, Uncle Henrik's home by the sea. All right, they're still in Denmark, they're out of Copenhagen now. Um, it's a house by the sea, and just across um, from where Uncle Henrik lives, they can see Sweden. So it's still in Denmark, but looking across the water, um, they can see Sweden from there. So remember, the whole book is about um, the Danish resistance um, getting the Jews from Denmark to Sweden. That's what they want to do. So that's what they're preparing everything right now at Uncle Henrik's house is to um, get those Jews from Denmark across the water to Sweden. Uh, so they are now at Uncle Henrik's house. Oh, Anne-Marie, Ellen said with awe in her voice, it is beautiful. Anne-Marie looked around and nodded her head in agreement. The house and the meadows that surrounded it were so much a part of her childhood, a part of her life that she didn't often look at them with fresh eyes. But now she did, seeing Ellen's pleasure. And it was true, they were beautiful. The little red roof farmhouse was very old, its chimney crooked, and even the small shuttered windows tilted at angles. A bird's nest, wispy with straw, was half hidden in the corner where the roof met the wall above the bedroom window. Nearby, a gnarled tree was still speckled with a few apples now long past right. Mama and Kirsty had gone inside, but Anne-Marie and Ellen ran across the high grass meadow through the late wildflowers. From nowhere, a gray kitten appeared and ran beside them, pouncing here and there upon imagined mice, pausing to lick its paws and then darting off again. It pretended to ignore the girls, but looked back often to be certain that they were still there, apparently pleased to have playmates. The meadow ended at the sea, and the gray water licked there at damp brown grass flattened by the wind and bordered by smooth, heavy stones. I have never been this close to the sea, Ellen said. Of course you have. You've been to the harbor in Copenhagen a million times. Ellen laughed. I mean the real sea, the way it is here, open like this, the whole world of water. Anne-Marie shook her head in amazement live in Denmark, a country surrounded by water and never to have stood at its edge. The parents are really city people, aren't they? Ellen nodded. My mother is afraid of the ocean, she said laughing. She says it's too big for her and too cold. The girls sat on a rock and took off their shoes and socks. They tiptoed across the damp stones and let the water touch their feet. It was cold. They giggled and stepped back. Anne-Marie leaned down and picked up a brown leaf that floated back and forth with the movement of the water. Look, she said, this leaf may have come from a tree in Sweden. It could have blown from a tree into the sea and floated all the way across. See over there, she said, pointing. See the land way across there? That's Sweden. Ellen cupped one hand over her eyes and looked across the water, the misty shoreline that was another country. It's not so very far, she said. Maybe, Anne-Marie suggested, standing over there were two girls just our age looking across and saying, that's Denmark. They squinted into the hazy distance as if they might see Swedish children standing there and looking back. But it was too far. They saw only the hazy strip of land and two small boats bobbing up and down in the gray ruffles of separating water. I wonder if one of those is your Uncle Henrik's boat, Ellen said. Maybe, I can't tell, they're too far away. Uncle Henrik's boat is named the Ingeborg, she told Ellen, for Mama. Ellen looked around, does he keep it right here? Does he tie it up so that it won't float away? Anne-Marie laughed, oh no, in town at the harbor, 
there's a big dock and all the fishing boats go and come from there. That's where they unload their fish. You should smell it. At night they all, they are all there anchored in the harbor. Anne Marie Ellen, Mama's voice came across the meadow. The girls looked around and saw her waving to them. They turned, picked up their shoes and began walking toward the house. The kitten who had settled comfortably on the stone, stony shore rose immediately and followed them. I took Ellen down to show her to the sea, Anne Marie explained when they reached the place where Mama waited. She'd never been that close before. We started to wade, but it was too cold. I wish we had come in summer so we could swim. It's cold even then, Mama said. She looked around. You didn't see anyone, did you? You didn't talk to anyone? Anne Marie shook her head. Just the kitten. Ellen had picked it up and lay it purring in her arms as she stroked its small head and talked to it softly. I meant to warn you, you must stay away from people while we are here. But there's no one around here, Anne Marie reminded her. Even so, if you see anyone at all, even someone you know, one of Henrik's friends, it is better if you come in the house. It is too difficult, maybe even dangerous, to explain who Helen is. Ellen looked up and bit her lip. There aren't soldiers here too? She asked. Mama sighed. I'm afraid there are soldiers everywhere, and especially now, this is a bad time. Come in now and help me fix supper. Henrik will be home soon. Watch the step there, it's loose. Do you know what I have done? I found enough apples for applesauce. Even though there is no sugar, the apples are sweet. Henry will bring some fish, and there is wood for the fire, so tonight we will be warm and fed. It is not a bad time then, Anne Marie told her. Not if there is applesauce. Ellen kissed the kitten's head and, it, and let it leap from her arm to the ground. It darted away and disappeared in the tall grass. They followed Mama into the house. That night, the girls dressed for bed in the small upstairs bedroom where they were sh that they were sharing, the same bedroom that had been Mama's when she was a little girl. Across the hall, Kirsty was already asleep in the wide bed that had once belonged to Anne Marie's grandparents. Ellen touched her neck after she had put on Anne Marie's flower spring nightgown, which Mama had packed. Where's my necklace, she asked. What did you do with it? I hid it in a safe place, Anne Marie told her a very secret place where no one will ever find it. And I will keep it there for you until it is safe for you to wear again. Ellen nodded. Papa gave it to me when I was very small, she explained. She sat down on the edge of the old bed and ran her fingers along the handmade quilt that covered it. The flowers and birds faded now had been stitched onto the quilt by Anne Marie's great grandmother many years before. I wish I knew where my parents are, Ellen said in a small voice as she outlined one of the applique birds with her finger. Amory didn't have an answer for her. She patted Ellen's hand and they sat together silently. Through the window, they could see a thin round slice of moon appear through the clouds against the pale sky. The Scandinavian night was not very dark yet though. Soon, when winter came, the night wouldn't be not only dark, but very long. Night skies beginning in the late afternoon and lasting through morning. From downstairs, they could hear Mama's voice and Uncle, Uncle Henrik's talking and catching up on the news. Mama missed her brother when she hadn't seen him for a while, Anne Marie knew. They were very close. Mama always teased him gently for not marrying. She asked him, laughing when they were together, whether he had found a good wife yet, one who would keep his house tidier. Henrik teased back and told Mama that she, she, should, she, she should come to Gilalai to live again so that he wouldn't have to do all the chores by himself. For a moment to Anne-Marie listening, it seemed like all the earlier times, the happy visits to the farm in the past with summer daylight extended beyond bedtime, with the children tucked away in the bedrooms and the grown-ups downstairs talking. But there was a difference. In the earlier times, she had always overheard laughter. Tonight, there was no laughter at all. Chapter eight, there has been a death. Through a haze of dreams, Anne-Marie heard Henrik rise and leave the house, headed for the barn with his milking pail at daybreak. Later, when she woke again, it was morning. She could hear birds calling outside, one of them close by the window in the apple tree. And she could hear Mama below in the kitchen talking to Kirsty. Ellen was still asleep. The night before, so shortened by the soldiers in the Copenhagen apartment seemed long ago. 
Anne-Marie rose quickly so that she wouldn't wake her friend. She pulled on her clothes and went down the narrow, curved staircase to find her sister kneeling on the kitchen floor, trying to make the gray kitten drink water from a bowl. Silly, she said. Kittens like milk, not water. I'm teaching this one new habits, Kirsty explained importantly, and I have named him Thor for the God of Thunder. And Marie burst out laughing. She looked at the tiny kitten who was shaking his head, irritated at his wet whiskers, as Kirsty kept trying to dip his face to the water. God of Thunder, and Marie said, he looks as if he would run and hide if there were a thunderstorm. He has a mother someplace who would comfort him, I imagine, Mama said. And when he wants milk, he'll find his mama. Or he could go visit the cow, Kirsty said. Although Uncle Henrik no longer raised crops on the farm as his parents had, he still kept a cow who munched happily on the meadow grass and gave a little milk each day in return. Now and then he was able to send cheese into Copenhagen to his sister's family. This morning, Anne-Marie noticed with delight, Mama had made oatmeal and there was a pitcher of cream on the table. It was a very long time since she had tasted cream. At home, they had bread and tea every morning. Mama followed Anne-Marie's eyes to the pitcher. Fresh from blossom, she said. Henrik milks her every morning before he leaves for the boat. And, she added, there's butter too. Usually not even Henrik has butter, but he managed to save a little this time. Save a little from what? Anne-Marie asked, spooning oatmeal into the flour bowl. Don't tell me the soldiers try to, what's the word, relocate butter too? She laughed at her own joke. But it wasn't a joke at all, though Mama laughed ruefully. They do, she said. They relocate all the farmer's butter right into the stomach of their army. I suppose that if they knew Henrik had kept this tiny bit, they would come with guns and march it away down the path. Kirsty joined their laughter as the three of them pictured a mound of frightened butter under military arrest. The kitten darted away when Kirsty's attention was distracted and settled on the windowsill. Suddenly, here in this sunlit kitchen, with cream in a pitcher and a bird in the apple tree beside the door, and out in the Cattegats, where Uncle Henrik, surrounded by blue sky and water, pulled in his nets filled with shiny silver fish. Suddenly, the specter of guns and grim-faced soldiers seemed nothing more than a ghost story, a joke with which to frighten children in the dark. Ellen appeared in the doorway, smiling sleepily, and Mama put another flower bowl of steaming oatmeal on the old wooden table. Cream, Anne-Marie said, gesturing to the pitcher with a grin. All day long, the girls played out of doors under the brilliant clear sky and sun. Anne-Marie took Ellen to the small pasture beyond the barn and introduced her to Blossom, who gave a lazy, rough textured lick to the palm of Ellen's hand when she extended it timidly. The kitten scampered about and chased flying insects across the meadow. The girls picked armfuls of wildflowers dried brown. Now, but by early fall chill, and arranged them in pots and pitchers until the tabletops were crowded with their bouquets. Inside the house, Mama scrubbed and dusted, tus tusking at Uncle Henrik's untidy housekeeping. She took the rugs out to the clothesline and beat them with a stick, scattering dust into the air. He needs a wife, she said, shaking her head, and attacked the old wooden floors with a broom while the rugs aired. Just look at this, she said, opening the door to the little useful formal living room with its old-fashioned furniture. He never dusts, and she picked up her cleaning rags. And Kirsty, she added, the god of thunder made a very small rain shower in the corner of the kitchen floor. Keep an eye on him. Late in the afternoon, Uncle Henrik came home. He grinned when he saw the newly cleaned and polished house, the double doors to the living room wide open and rugs aired, and the windows washed. Henrik, you need a wife, Mama scolded him. Uncle Henrik laughed and joined Mama on the steps near the kitchen door. Why do I need a wife when I have a sister? He asked in a booming voice. Mama sighed, but her eyes were twinkling and you need to stay home more often to take care of the house. This step is broken and there is a leaking faucet in the kitchen and, 
Henrik was grinning at her, shaking his head in mock dismay. And there are mice in the attic, and my brown sweater has a big moth hole in the sleeve, and if I don't wash the windows soon, they laugh together. Anyway, Mama said, I have opened every window, Henrik, to let in to let the air in and the sunlight. Thank goodness it is such a beautiful day. Tomorrow will be tomorrow will be a day for fishing, Henrik said, his smile disappearing. Anne Maria listening recognized the odd phrase. Papa had said something like it on the telephone. Is the weather good for fishing, Henrik? Papa had asked. But what did it mean? Henrik went fishing every day, rain or shine. Denmark's fishermen didn't wait for sunny days to take their boats out and throw their nets into the sea. Anne Marie, silent, sitting with Ellen under the apple tree, watched her uncle. Mama looked at him. The weather is right? she asked. Henrik nodded and looked at the sky. He smelled the air. I will be going back to the boat tonight after supper. We will leave very early in the morning. I will stay on the boat all night. Anne-Marie wondered what it would be like to be on a boat all night, to lie at anchor, hearing the sea slap against the sides, to see the stars from your place on the sea. You have prepared the living room? Uncle Henrik asked suddenly. Mama nodded. It is clean that I moved the furniture a bit to make room. And you saw the flowers, she added. I hadn't thought of it, but the girls picked dried flowers from the meadow. Prepared the living room for what? Anne Marie asked. Why did you move the furniture? Mama looked at Uncle Henrik. He had reached down for the kitten, scampering past, and now held it against his chest and scratched its chin gently. It arched its small back with pleasure. Well, girls, he said, it is a sad event, but not too sad, really because she was very, very old. There has been a death, and tonight your great aunt Bertie will be resting in the living room in her casket before she is buried tomorrow. It is the old custom, you know, for the dead to rest at home and their loved ones to be with them before burial. Kirsty was listening with a fascinated look. Right here? She asked. A dead person right here? Anne Marie said nothing. She was confused. This was the first she had heard of the death in the family. No one had called Copenhagen to say there had been a death. No one had seemed sad. And, most puzzling of all, she had never heard of the name before. Great Aunt Bertie? Surely she would have known if she had a relative by that name. Kirsty might not. Kirsty was little and didn't pay attention to such things. But Anne Marie did. She had always been fascinated by her mother's stories of her own childhood. She remembered the names of all the cousins, the great aunts and uncles, who had been a tease, who had been a grouch, who had been such a scold that her husband had finally moved away to a different house, though they continued to have dinner together every night. Such wonderful, interesting stories filled with the colorful personalities of her mother's family. And Anne Marie was quite, quite certain, though she said nothing, there was no great Aunt Bertie. She didn't exist. All right, class, we finished chapter eight today. We will pick up with chapter nine next time. So you have a great day, and we will see you soon. Bye.